Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Um, Holy Spirit, we just say, have your way. We say, let us not be people that look the same as the world. We say, let there be a fragrance of life on us to your children, to the ones that you've called. And let there be a fragrance of death on us to the devil and to the enemy. Lord God, let us move in power. Let us speak in truth. Let us act and move in freedom. And would you teach us to do that here today in Jesus' name? Amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to start off today. Uh, our root scripture, if you want to turn with me, is Luke 24. Uh, we we'll start in verse 13. Now, before I read the scripture, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about these two individuals. These are two disciples of Jesus. I'm not talking about unbelievers. I'm talking about people that walked with Jesus here on earth. These are two people that are walking along the road. This is after Jesus had been crucified. This is after Jesus is resurrected and there's rumors floating around. And these two men are walking along the road of Emmaus away from, or to Emmaus from Jerusalem, which is about seven to 17 miles. Okay, and it starts off, it says, now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all the things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were restrained, so they did not know him. What I wanna teach you today is a little bit about what we learned at the conference. I wanna teach you guys how to dissect scripture, how to ask questions. One thing that stuck with me from one of the leaders there was he said, I want you when you read a passage to read it as if it's the only passage that you have from the Bible. It's the only thing that you've read up until that time. Read it for the very first time with fresh eyes. Remove everything that you know up to this point about being with Jesus and take a look at this as if you're somebody in prison and somebody snuck this passage into you and this is all you got. So that's what we're gonna do today. There's gonna be a lot of questions, okay? So my first question here, my first thing that I'm, that I'm looking at here is why are their eyes restrained? What? Why, 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 why would God... Because God's all powerful, right? God is the one that does these things, right? Why would God restrain their eyes from Jesus? We find the answer when we go back to Proverbs 25. It says, God conceals the revelation of his word in the hiding place of his glory. But the honor of kings is revealed by how they thoroughly search out the deeper meaning of all that God says. So God conceals the revelation of his word, meaning Jesus. Jesus is the word in the hiding place of his glory. Where is that? Where's the hiding place of his glory? Where can we find the revelation of his word? Can I get the next one? Jesus is praying, so my father, restore me back to the glory that we shared together when we were. Come on now, be alive. When we were. Jesus tells us to go into the secret place, shut the door and pray to our father, right? Hiding place. What are you doing when you're in that place? You're, come on, say it. Talk back to me now. Let's do it, guys. We need to get into the presence of God. They're talking about Jesus, but they don't recognize him face to face. They didn't spend the time. When they were in the presence of him, they weren't even, they, they probably weren't even paying attention to his face. It's so hard for me to, to, to wrestle with the fact that they were walking with Jesus. They had obviously seen Jesus. They saw him be crucified. And then they're walking along and all of a sudden here comes Jesus and they just, they don't recognize him. If we're being honest with ourselves, is that, is that what's happened to you sometimes? You've heard about Jesus, you know about Jesus, you can talk about Jesus, but when it comes time being face to face with Jesus, can you recognize him? Can you know what he's saying? Maybe he's saying something hard and you just don't wanna hear it, so you can't recognize that it's Jesus, so you automatically go back to those father wounds or you go back to those relationship wounds or you go back to those older brother or older sister. Can you recognize him? 
Can you know what he's saying? Conflicting the voice Maybe he's saying Jesus something hard with hurt. And, and with you pain. just. My next question is, can we get the next slide? <laughs> Who are the kings? Proverbs says it's the glory of the kings. Who is that? Who is that? Come on. First Peter chapter two, verse nine says, but you are God's chosen treasure. Priests who are a spiritual nation set apart as God's devoted ones. He called you out of darkness to experience his marvelous light. And now he claims you as his very own. He did this so that you would broadcast his glorious wonders throughout the world. Ladies and gentlemen, we got responsibilities. We have responsibilities. We have responsibilities to seek out God. We have responsibilities to know God. We have responsibilities to reflect God. Western culture, we've done this down to, I know Jesus, I'm gonna go out and do my thing, but I'm good, y'all figure it out yourself. Jesus, bless me, bless me, bless me. Give me all that I need. But you walk right past that person on the sidewalk or on the street that's saying, help me. Friends, we have a responsibility to be Christ-like, not just Christian. The world has plenty of Christians, but Christian actually means Christ-like. You're supposed to bear his image. That's what you were created for. You were not created to make businesses. You were not created to make ministries. You were not created to drop clothing lines, to make music, to do any of these things. That's not what you were created for. Those are amazing things that God can move through, but it was not what you were created for. When we go all the way back to Genesis, he said, let us, actually they said, Father, Son, Holy Spirit together in community said, let us make man in our, in, in our, our purpose. The reason why we're here is to bear his image. Do not get your gifts confused with your purpose. Ladies and gentlemen, you are, amen, amen. You guys are kings and queens under the most high king. Joanne Moody, my spiritual mother, the spiritual mother to many in this house says, you are ambassadors of the kingdom of God. You harness the full power of God in the kingdom and you are called to bring it here on earth. My next question, bring it up, Michaela. Come on now, girl. What does it mean to thoroughly search out the deeper meaning of all that God says? I think David is a pretty good guy to go off reference of what that might mean. He says, God of my life, I'm love sick for you in this weary wilderness. I thirst with the deepest longings to love you more, with cravings in my heart that can't be described. Such yearning grips my soul for you, O oh God. What does it mean to thoroughly search out all that God says? It means that what God is doing, what God is saying, who God is, is the most important thing you got going on at all times. You hang on the words of God. You want him more than you want your next breath. You thirst for him more than you thirst for water. You hunger for him more than you hunger for food. This is why fasting is so powerful. It's a direct assault on your flesh. It's saying, God, I don't need anything that this world has for me. I just want you. You feed me, you sustain me. You bring me life. Friends, all this, is, all this is great. We can say amen. We can agree on it. But the biggest thing is we need to be able to diagnose when we have restrained eyes. Wouldn't you agree? We need to know what it looks like to have restrained eyes. So what are those symptoms? Let's go on, you know, wiki meds and type in, how do I know I have restrained eyes and I'll start freaking out. <laughs> 
What are we looking like, Michaela? Come on, girl. First symptom is Jesus looks and feels like a stranger rather than your friend. Verse 18 says, then the, ones, the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? What? Jesus? The king? The creator? A, str- a stranger. I don't know if y'all are seeing what I'm seeing. He's calling Jesus a stranger to Jerusalem. A couple, like a week before, Jesus was riding in and he was being presented. Hosanna, Hosanna, praise God to the highest. Blessed are are the feet that come in the name of the Lord. Now he's a stranger? Friends, is Jesus a stranger in your life? Come on. Symptom number two. It's Jesus was rather than Jesus is. Verse 19, and he said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. Now I could preach on this, just this alone. Apparently Jesus was, he not, he's not is, which means that he's dead. He's a dead king. He's not alive. He's a dead God. He doesn't even go as far to say he's a dead God. He says that he's not even God. He's just a prophet. You know who else recognizes Jesus as just a prophet? Islam. They deny the deity. They deny the claims. They deny the, the crucifixion. They deny the resurrection. They say, he's just, he's he's a mighty prophet. Blessed be his name, peace be upon his name. He's not just a prophet. He's not just mighty in deed and in word. He is God and he's not dead. He's alive and he's moving today. He can heal you. He can restore you. He can redeem you. And that's what he wants to do today. And I just feel the conviction to say this right now. This is an open altar. You don't have to wait to come up here. We have plenty of loving people on a prayer team that will not shy away from coming and laying hands on you if you're convicted right now. Jesus is moving and he's alive. The Holy Spirit is moving. He's here today. He wants to change your life. He wants to restore your relationships. He wants to redeem the things that the devil tried to take from you and multiply it in your life. But it just takes us recognizing that and inviting him in. Amen. Next symptom. You're submitted to the world rather than the word. I want to see if you guys catch this. Can we all read it together? And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. Whose rulers? are not submitted to him. They never were. Our rulers. Can't tell me it's a typo because they said the chief priests. Why wouldn't you say the rulers? Said our rulers. You see, this is something that I've learned diving into scripture is God doesn't place certain words in there as an accident. Like he's just like, oh, that sounds good. We'll go with that. We don't even know. Like there's purpose. Like God's language is important. We need to pay attention to the language that God is using because there's specific reasons behind it. He's showing something. And God can speak so much more through one word than we could speak through a thousand. One word can change everything. Who are you submitted to? Honestly ask yourself, are you submitted to Jesus or are you submitted to your bank account? Are you submitted to Jesus or are you submitted to your job title? Are you submitted to Jesus or are you submitted to your Instagram or Twitter or Facebook following? Are you submitted to Jesus or are you submitted to your ministry? To the pulpit, to your friends, to your family, to your spouse, to your kids, 
to your trauma. Who are you submitted to? And last thing, do you walk by sight rather than by faith? Verse 21, but we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things have happened. You see, friends, what's actually happening here is they're saying we were hoping, which means uh, we're not really hoping anymore. It's kind of looking pretty bleak, uh, you know, dim and, and bleak over here. But then they say, today is the third day since all these things have happened. You see, there was a belief that was going on back in that time. And they believed like uh, it was three days afterwards was when the spirit left the body and any chance of them being revived was done. So at this point, they're like, man, my circum- these circumstances, they don't, they don't look good. They look really, 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 really bad. And my question to you today, are you only as good as as good as it's going? Friends, Western culture, Western Christianity loves to tell us, again, bless me, bless me, bless me, God, indeed. Give me the house, give me the car, give me the finances, everything's going to be great. Friends, we're promised trials, tribulations, hardships. We're promised that. You sign up for Jesus, that is one of the guaranteed things you're getting. He said, you're going to share with me in glory, but you're going to share with me in my suffering too. He says, he says to the disciples, can you drink the cup that I'm about to drink? And they say, yeah, we can. He goes, oh, you will. <laughs> Guys, we're promised to inherit the kingdom, but we're promised to inherit the kingdom the same way that he inherited it. By denying ourselves, picking up our cross and following him. Yeah. So there may be some people in here, if, you're, if we're being honest, they're like, oh, I'm blind. Okay, I'm blind. I get it. I got restrained eyes. How do I see? Glad you asked. First thing we have to recognize that Jesus never stopped teaching. You just stopped listening. You just stopped listening. I love uh, one, of the, one of the people who came up here and spoke. It was a while ago. I think it might've been Dr. John. Um, he said, if you haven't seen God in a while, if you haven't heard God in a while, then you need to go back to where you last heard him. Amen. Amen. I got to breeze through this. So then he said to them, oh, foolish ones, slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ have suffered these things and enter his glory? In the beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. For seven miles, Jesus took over the conversation and started teaching. He made sure that you have everything that you need. Tune in. Tune in to his frequency. Look for him and focus. Point number two. Don't expect Jesus to kick down your door. He'll never force his company. But what he will do is he'll give you an opportunity to invite. Rawr. That's my daughter. I can growl at her. It's okay. (laughs) So many people, they're saying, God, make me do this. God, do this for me. God, just take over. Put me on on a glove like you did with Gideon and just play me like a puppet. It doesn't work like that. That's not love. That's not submission. Invite him in. You have to make these decisions sometimes. And they're not easy. Jesus says, behold, I'm standing at the door knocking. If your heart is open to hear my voice and you open the door within, I will come in to you and I will feast with you and you will feast with me. Funny how this is what happens on Emmaus. They said, then they drew near to the village where they were going and he indicated that he would have gone farther, but they constrained him. I'm gonna make this point. They constrained him. They didn't say, oh, will you please just, come on, man, just come stay. Like, it's gonna be great. Like, I, the wife's been preparing this thing. It's gonna be awesome. You know, if you got time, just slide by. No, they're like, don't go, please. Constrain means to hold. They're, they're not being passive. Stop being passive with Jesus. There was nothing passive about what he did for you. In the same token, stop being passive with the devil. 
The devil's coming for you. This is a game of aggression when it comes to relationship and when it comes to war. Point number three, give him your home. Now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took the bread, blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. Friends, let me just ask you a question. We're gonna see if Western culture lines up with Jewish culture. If you had a stranger come over to your house, is it the stranger's responsibility to take the bread and bless it? Would you let a stranger take leadership in your home? Neither did the Jews. Like it was the same thing. When a stranger came in, their job was to submit, their job was to enjoy, and the host's job was to take the bread and bless it. Unless, I found this, so cool. It's from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, it's, it's weird, it's called like one QSA column two, I'm sure, you, amen, my man. I told you he was gonna be proud of me. I went Bible nerd today. <laughs> Verse 18 says, community, uh, it just starts off, I'll say, the table of community is prepared and the new wine is mixed for drinking. No one should stretch out his hand to the first fruit of the bread and of the wine before the priest, or he is the, or he is the one who blesses the first fruit of the bread and the wine and stretches out his hands toward the bread. Afterwards, the Messiah of Israel shall stretch out his hand towards the bread and afterwards shall bless all the congregation of the community, each one according to his dignity. There was an understanding that if you host the home, you are the one to bless the bread unless the Messiah is present. In that moment, when Jesus takes the bread, there's a transaction of authority. There's a transaction of submission happening. Jesus takes the bread by doing that. He's saying, I am the priest. I am the Messiah. I am. And the host of the house is saying, I recognize. I submit to you. I submit to you. His eyes are still restrained in this moment, but there's faith happening. Ooh, there's faith because his eyes aren't opened until the next verse. Give me number four. And it says, then his eyes, their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. I believe this is truly saying that you need to have faith in Jesus before you see Jesus. Faith is the gateway. And there's somebody that I don't really think is, there's no one other better qualified to talk about remaining and knowing Jesus because the worst thing that we can do is mistake knowing about him for knowing him. And I've watched this young lady move um, in Jesus and reflect Jesus and they do it in their household. So it's an honor and a privilege to invite my sister up and she's gonna kill it. So everybody please welcome Vanessa Leon. Thank you, brother. Um, wow, dude, you killed it. That was so good. I hope everyone had a wonderful Thanksgiving. We're going to um, go turn it down from 400 degrees a little bit to maybe 250. So we're entering into this month that is a very busy month. Uh, we're going from holiday parties to events, and it's not just the busyness that comes with those things. It's the busyness that comes, like the errands that are associated with those events. You're going to each party, and you're going, oh, yeah, man, I forgot. I got to go get um, a side dish for that. Oh, man, I got to go get an ugly sweater for that party. And then, oh, wait, we got to bring appetizers to that. Oh, we forgot. We need to go buy another white elephant gift and the wrapping paper, and the tissue paper, and the tags, and so on, and so on, and so on, and it just becomes busy. And we as Christians love to say that Jesus is the reason for the season. 
And yet, in all of the busyness, where does he fit in? But the truth is, he shouldn't have to fit in anywhere because he's everything. But it's easy for people to really experience anxiety, depression, and just plain exhaustion during this time. Because it's not just about the season, but this is just about life, the seasons of busyness. So what are we doing to remain in Jesus as he remains in his Father? In our culture, we're constantly busy. And if you go after church today and you ask somebody, hey, how's life? They're probably going to respond with something like, oh, man, we've been busy. Probably not now after this, but... (laughs) But in our culture, especially Americans, as I've traveled the world and talked to people and watched how they really slow down in different cultures, but especially in the American culture, we wear busyness as a badge of honor. And it's like, how much can I pack into my schedule? What kind of activities are kids involved in? And how can we attack, divide and conquer and attack this schedule with my spouse? Mm. And now we find ourselves fighting against a schedule, a busy schedule, rather than the principalities and powers and rulers of darkness of this world like we're told in Ephesians 6. But, unless, of course, the enemy is using busyness as a power of darkness. I'm not trying to get all super spiritual here. But we got to think about this because we know the enemy is out there and he can and will use anything if it can get your eyes off of Jesus, if it get, can get your eyes off of God, and if it can get you to ignore the Holy Spirit within you. So my hope today in this short session we have with each other is to give you a caution but it's also to encourage you. It's a warning and a promise. It's my hope that you be flourishing as a believer after this in the midst of a culture that honors busyness. It's about understanding how we stand out amongst the world. It's about your heart and you remaining in his love, his joy, and his peace. And hopefully it's giving you an anchor in the midst of the storms of life. Because the Lord... Um, and having discernment for these things as the enemy is using them in our everyday life. For myself, the Lord's been teaching me about rest. And I, it's been months. (laughs) I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I'm an entrepreneur alongside with my husband in real estate. I have four boys under the age of almost 11. And on top of that, now the Lord's like, hey, come do ministry with me. So if anybody knows busy, I know busy. We know busy. And um, I know for for me, I tend to work, or I tend to lean towards uh, workaholism. It's some kind of ism, but I almost said the wrong thing. Workaholism. (laughs) Woo! That was almost recorded. I know how to work hard, and for anybody that knows the Enneagrams, I am a type three, and that person, that title is called the achiever, and we make, uh, we, we aim to make things look easy, even when they are not. They're actually really, really hard, because there's this thing inside of me that wants to just achieve things, and do things, and work hard, and that's where I find my identity, and the Lord knows these things about me. He created me, and he's walking me through that. You now know this, too. (laughs) And he's walking me through this, but he's teaching me that I have to rest. He's been gently guiding me because he's showing me that where he's taking me, if I don't learn how to rest and abide in him, it will not be sustainable. The good things that he has for us will not be sustainable. And I believe this is true for us as a church. If you don't know how to rest and abide in Jesus, we won't be able to handle what's coming. 
We pray for revival so often. Oh God, bring your spirit, bring revival. What if revival happens? And by that I mean an influx of salvations. And yet we don't know how to rest and remain. We will immediately get caught up in ministry and lose it all. We have to know that. What if he call, is finally calling us into the fullness of the calling that he has for us, but we don't have the solid foundation of resting in him? It will all crumble. There are so many stories of wonderful, incredibly gifted people that haven't slowed down to build their foundation with Jesus, and they get caught up in the call, and everything crumbles. That is not what we want. So what happens when we get, um, no, but whatever, we need to, what we need to focus on is where he's calling us. And it's this idea of how long can we go on an empty tank? How long can we go burning the candle at both ends? And here's the interesting thing I was thinking about is when you burn a candle at both ends, it burns brighter than one end. But it gets burnt out quicker. So we may look great. We may be looking like we're burning bright for the Lord, and yet we're going to burn out so fast. We can't do that. The whole point of our life is to never fulfill the scripture in Matthew 7. Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we did not prophesy in your name, or we, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And that scripture always terrifies me because these people thought they were doing good for him. And in the last moment, he was like, I didn't know you. That word new right there in Greek is gnosko, which means to learn, to know, come to know, get a knowledge of, perceive, or to become known. Jesus didn't know them because they never made themselves become known to him. It's like Jesus never had the chance to get to know them intimately before they started swinging around his name and using it. So let's put it this other way. How does this scenario work for you? You're going to the store, walking in, the, and someone stops you in the parking lot, and they're like, hey, hey, I'm so glad I caught you. I, um, I've been doing all these great things for you. I uh, actually called your friends, let them know that you really care for them. I um, knew that there was a bunch of business that you needed to attend to, so I made sure I took care of all of that. And then also, I wanted to let you know that I picked up your kids, and I started feeding them, and I let them know that I was coming there on your behalf. And so they trusted me, and it was all great. And so they're good. I'm sorry, but I'm not even going to go on, because as a mama, I'm stopping right there. You cross the line when you involve my kids. I'd probably be like, who the heck are you and what gives you the right to use my name, my life, to do things that are supposedly good for me because you don't have that right or authority? Those type of tasks are for someone that I intimately know, that I intimately trust. That's the only people that I would trust with my children, with the, my tasks of my life, with my relationships and to operate on, on behalf of my name. And I think this is what Jesus is saying here. This last month I've been reading John 15, and it has been bread to me. And this in the next few minutes is where we're going to focus. And Jesus is talking about him being the true vine and us being the branches, and how we must remain in him as he is in us. So what does it mean to stay connected and remain with him? What does it look like to be disconnected but still look like a branch? So let's read John 15, 1 through 6. 
I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. So, how do you know if you've been disconnected from the vine? Because here's the thing. When you cut off a branch, it doesn't immediately die. It still has living water in it, and it still looks like a branch. And that's the space where we find ourselves living a whole lot, because we still look like Christians, we still talk like Christians, and we still do what they do. But the living water inside of that branch eventually will dehydrate, and that branch will eventually shrivel and entirely die. So this is the caution. So how long will it take before we realize we've been cut off? Maybe this will help. Brandon and I have been reading this book called The Emotionally Healthy Leader by Peter Scazzaro, and it has been wrecking us in the best of ways. And in this, um, he said, these are the signs you've been disconnected and need to slow down to be, con be connected once again. See if you can identify with any one of these. You know you're disconnected when you can't shake the pressure you feel from having too much to do in too little time are always rushing, routinely fire off quick opinions and judgments, are often fearful of the future, are overly concerned with what others think, are defensive and easily offended, are routinely preoccupied and distracted, consistently ignore the stress, anxiety, and the tightness in your body, feel unenthusiastic or threatened by the success of others, routinely spend more time talking than listening, I don't know about you, but I can relate to many of those. <laughs> and by God's grace, there's something called green wood. Green wood. When a branch from the vine, a grapevine is cut off, it still has the water in it, it's called a green wood. It's called green wood. And it has the ability, as long as it has living water inside of it, to be grafted back into the grapevine. And that's the promise. So what does it look like to reconnect and remain? Because I believe we have that opportunity. Because we haven't been thrown into the fire. <laughs> so we're still here. We're still branches. And we still can reconnect. I would say it'd be seek, slow down, silence, and solitude. Silence and solitude. Okay. It was really one line in my head, but, you know, four things, I guess. So in seeking, just simply put, we're looking for the scriptures. We're reading scripture. We went to the preacher's conference like we're all talking about, and in there they said it like this. We're seeking out scripture not just for a word, but for the word, which is Jesus. John 1.14 says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We're seeking Jesus in the word. We read to find him. And if you need a good little spot, join me in John 14 through 17, because it's all red text. And it is the heart of Jesus for us. And it is beautiful. We're also going to seek the Holy Spirit. What does he have to say about the matters that you're dealing with? Because it's not just limited to the scriptures. Jesus is very clear about that in John 16, 12 through 14. I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear now, he said. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will only speak what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you.
So we are communing not just with the scriptures, but we are communing with the spirit within us. The second one is slow down. I challenge us to take a serious look at our schedule. And this is a perfect time, because next time we see you, it's December. <laughs> and the, the parties are already lining up. Staff parties and work parties, church parties, all the things. And it's stacking, but we need to look at our schedule. Not just for the month, but our daily lives. Where do I need to slow down? What do I need to remove? How am I honoring the Lord with my precious time? And when we're feeling those things that we just talked about earlier, feeling rushed, feeling pressured, not enough time, all those things that we're starting to feel up, then we need to stop and step away to slow down with him. Stop burning bright on both ends. And in slowing down, I'd also challenge you <laughs> to incorporate a Sabbath. This sounds, you guys, nearly impossible to do, to set aside a 24-hour period that you do not work. And that means no chores, no errands, no, like, I mean, you don't have to get all religious about it. <laughs> of the do's and don'ts. Because really, if you sought the Lord on it, he's going to tell you what you should do or not do. But I would invite you alongside us in the struggle, because our household right now is struggling through this, but it's something that we know we want to incorporate. And for us, we're going to start with just an evening, because we do. We have four young boys, and so you see them all over the place. So he knows, you know, that's not always rest when you're just hanging out with the four boys. <laughs> But I would ask you and invite you into that. Because when we do that, when we set aside time like a Sabbath, we're acknowledging him that we can't, acknowledging the Lord that we can't do anything without him. It's not about our works. It's not about the provision. It's literally him. We are nothing. We can do nothing without him. And so in stepping back and slowing down, number one, the world doesn't do it. So that alone is going to set you apart. My husband is in real estate, and he's always told his clients, hey, I don't work on Sundays. And when he tells other real estate agents that, they usually look at him like, what? The weekend's some of the busiest time. And yet, that sets him apart, because it's something him and the Lord has decided together to rest in a job that is all based on him. If he doesn't work, there's no job. So I'd invite you into that. The last thing would be silence and solitude. And I didn't, <laughs> ideally we'd be spending some more time. But I'd say start with two to three minutes. Two to three minutes a day. No scripture, no music, no praying, just silence. And this sounds, okay, okay. it's incredibly difficult especially in our culture, our day and age. But it's often in the silence that he speaks. Jesus did this often. And if he did it, how much more so we should. Silence and solitude are not easy because we oftentimes hide in the busyness. If we slow down or are silent and alone, we're often confronted with parts of ourselves that need Jesus, that we didn't know about. We're confronted with bottled emotions that we've never had time to deal with. And so even though it is a scary thing, that is the very space in which the Lord cleanses and prunes us. He refines us in that space. And when he, like the scripture said, he prunes us, we bear fruit. And as John states, God is the gardener. And when we bear fruit, we bring him glory. John 15, 8 says, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Now, I myself am a gardener. I do love to garden. And every gardener's reward is the flower, the fruit, 
or the vegetable that the plant produces because you have put in some work. You've gotten dirty, you have watered it, you have given it the nutrients it needs, you have perfectly planned the location so it gets the right sun, all the things. And the pride of the gardener comes from the result of his labor. And the plant is able to flourish because of that labor. And that's where the fruit comes. And when there is fruit, the world sees disciples of Christ. So this is no easy task to slow down, be silent, and begin to look within ourselves as the Father begins to cleanse us. But I urge you, as a sister, it's not, just, it's not too late to be grafted back into the vine. There's no shame since we're fighting this together. We're fighting against a culture that is honoring busyness in our lives, and it's pulling us away, even with good things from our Lord. And so we are all fighting this, and it is so incredibly easy to be pulled so as we embark on this, let us view busyness as for what it truly is during the most busiest time of the year and allow our soul to rest enough to be able to fully acknowledge that Jesus really is the reason for the season. Uh, if you haven't been convicted by either of the messages, we have defibrillators at the doors in the back, because clearly you need some help. <laughs> um, we're going to take a moment to actually practice some of what Vanessa was just talking about. Um, silence and solitude is something that I personally have wrestled back and forth with, uh, just in terms of forcing myself to do it. Um, and everything that was being shared today was 100% just what I'm, to be candid, experiencing in my own life. Um, being bivocational is amazing, and I'm also figuring out the pace of that currently. Um, but we are going to, uh, I'm going to set a timer on my phone. We're actually just going to spend three minutes. Um, I'm actually going to ask for no piano during that time. Um, <clears throat> we're just going to do silence. Some of you just got really nervous. You're going to be okay. Um, one of the reasons why uh, this is really powerful is because it helps you realize that for some of you, the emotions that you've been running away from in your busyness actually won't kill you when you slow down. Nervous laughter, I like it. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to set a timer on my phone. We're going to do easy, three minutes. I could have gone for five, but we're going to do three. <laughs> we're going to do three. I'm going to stretch you. <laughs> All right, so Holy Spirit, come help us, show us Jesus.
So Jesus, we just look to you. We thank you for what you're doing in our community. We thank you for what you're doing in our body. God, we just ask that you would teach us how to submit, teach us how to yield, teach us how to slow down, remind us that you're the God who's not in a hurry, you're not in a rush, especially as we walk into December with all the things that we do and fill our time with, like it was said, that we like to tell ourselves has to do with good things, has to do with you, and so many times we're just trying to keep up appearances, make other people happy, and run away from what's really going on, God, that this would be a different December for us. In Jesus' name, amen.